and the screen is yours, Sebastian. Okay, cool. Can you see my screen? Does that work? Yes. Yeah, yes. okay, fantastic, cool. Um, all right, so as you already heard from Cesar, I'll be talking to you uh, today about um, transferring knowledge across different languages. And I'm particularly glad that um, to see that you've previously this year had a presentation uh, by Thomas Wolf about transfer learning in general, because I think a lot of the intuitions from that uh, presentation uh, will also be useful here. Um, and so on this note, um, I find it uh, useful to um, kind of briefly rec recapitulate why it makes sense to do transfer learning in general, and then specifically with regard to transferring across different languages. And as you might um, remember from the previous um, conversation from Thomas, um, transfer learning is most useful when um, the different settings we try to transfer between um, share some underlying or common knowledge. Um, so if they rely on similar representations, for instance. Um, and um, generally the same also applies to the setting of transferring between different languages, because um, generally, like from linguistics, we know um, that also languages share um, commonalities in many different levels of meaning. Um, and transfer learning in practice is most useful when annotated label data is particularly rare or hard to obtain. And this is the case for most of the world's languages where it's often uh, quite difficult to obtain uh, enough data at, sc at scale for these languages. And empirically, um, if you've been following the field of natural language processing for uh, the last two years or so at least, uh, you might have seen that transfer learning or uh, parts, uh, methods in that field have led to uh, impressive results across a wide range of different tasks in natural language processing. And to just um, cherry pick um, and look at the progress on one, I think, quite representative task in NLP, uh, which is uh, named entity recognition. Um, on the standard data set of uh, Connell 2003. And here, what I find quite uh, instructive is that we can um, look at the different advances that have been made on this task from its inception in 2003, um, all the way until um, last year, essentially. And uh, what is quite interesting here to observe is that um, the improvements in the first years on this task have been mainly due to better representations on the word level. Um, whereas um, most improvements in later years have been due to better um, deep representations, mostly driven by advances in pre-training and training large deep uh, transformer models. And uh, a similar trend um, has also been um, applied in the field of learning cross-lingual representations and cross-lingual transfer learning. Um, where most of the early work is also focused on learning cross-lingual word representations and much of the work in the last few years or um, mainly in the last year has focused on learning deep cross-lingual representations which is going to be the main subject of this talk. Um, to provide some additional context, I um, also think it's useful to think of transfer learning across different languages um, in the broader context of um, other areas of transfer learning. Um, in particular, we can um, divide transfer learning um, across two different dimensions uh, based on the characteristics of the source and the target setting. Um, so in one setting, um, we are dealing with the same task in the source and um, the target setting between which we're trying to transfer. Um, in which case, uh, if we're trying to transfer between different domains, people have been studying that in NLP um, as domain adaptation. Um, or in, uh, when we're transferring between different languages, uh, we, are, we can call that cross-lingual learning or cross-lingual transfer learning, which is going to be the main subject of this talk. And relatedly, we can also try to transfer between uh, different tasks. Um, in this case, people typically differentiate whether we have data for all of those tasks available at the same time, in which case we can typically apply multitask learning and train a joint model on the, later, uh, on the data of all of those tasks. Or, um, and that has uh, recently become more popular, we can um, train a model on data of a proxy or a surrogate task where we might have more data available and then sequentially um, transfer that model to uh, another task that we actually care about. Um, the second um, and perhaps bigger uh, issue that is at the heart of this uh, talk is the topic of uh, language diversity in NLP. And by that, uh, I mean, uh, in particular, the um, 
um, discrepancy between the number of languages that are spoken around the world and the fact that most NLP research to date has focused on developing methods um, that work well only for a small subset of languages uh, with large amounts of data available online. And um, in particular, most methods are specifically developed to work well only for the English language. Um, in practice, this discrepancy um, between um, uh, the number of languages spoken and the reality in NLP research, I think has two um, very big practical implications. Um, the first one being that by focusing only on a subset of languages, um, we are systematically excluding um, more than 3 billion speakers um, of lesser resource languages around the world. Um, and while this ha can have um, a lot of uh, impacts in day-to-day -day life, I just want to highlight here one potential application that might be impacted um, if in a post-COVID era or in, a, in an era where we can actually um, go out for dinner uh, properly and we're in a, a large city such as New York and we're looking for a place to go uh, for dinner, uh, we can make a query in a popular uh, maps application and are provided with a number of options in a high usage language. Um, we can make a similar query in another high usage language such as Spanish and would be provided with a similar set of options. Um, but now if we make an identical query in a language with much fewer data, such as Basque, um, we are provided with no options at all. And given that this is a problem even for data that is uh, as commonplace as data about restaurants, uh, for a language that is still uh, European, um, so arguably more resourced than most of the other world's languages, um, you can imagine um, what um, big of an impact this has for most of the uh, world's other languages with data that might be much more critical to people's lives, uh, such as data about clinical or healthcare information. Um, and secondly, I think also as a community, we've really um, built our models with assumptions of the English language in mind. Um, so the inductive biases and the way we've designed our methods um, uh, can really have been overfit to properties of the English language. Um, so even though we've seen very stark improvements um, in recent years on um, a wide variety of different benchmarks, such as NER, or here uh, you can see the progress on uh, question answering, uh, most of these results have really only been achieved for this small set of high resource languages. And it's really not at all clear how well our methods actually um, generalize or perform for mo most of the uh, world's remaining languages. Um, the solution and the general paradigm that I'll be talking about for the remainder of this talk focuses on learning uh, cross-lingual representations. And you can see this um, kind of in contrast to more classical approaches in NLP, which typically resort to training um, language-specific models uh, and applying language-specific preprocessing and feature engineering. And um, in contrast, now in the era of neural networks um, and representation learning, um, the preferred paradigm instead is to um, learn vector representations and embeddings of um, words or concepts in different languages, and then apply this um, transfer learning formula that has been so successful in English, um, as well to these multilingual representations that we've learned. And this uh, transfer learning formula, which might um, be, uh, which you might remember from Thomas' talk, essentially consists of two main steps. Um, in the first step, um, given a large unlabeled corpus of text, um, you would use your representation uh, learning method of choice, such as a word embedding method like word to back or a deep neural network based method um, such as BERT to learn general purpose representations from this data. Um, and then, given that you've learned these uh, general purpose representations, um, provided with um, some number of manually annotated human curated labels, um, you can then fine tune your model on these labels um, to, um, uh, to obtain a model that does reasonably well on a given downstream task of interest. Now, in the cross angle setting, um, the current um, state-of-the-art approach or the main uh, way um, people have been tackling this multilingual transfer learning setting recently um, essentially also consists of uh, these two steps with a final um, third step of cross-lingual transfer. Um, so in this case, again, in the first step, we try to learn um, general purpose, now multilingual representations um, that capture 
um, joint knowledge um, in the same shared space uh, across different languages. Um, so ideally in this space, we would ultimately like to um, put words or semantic concepts that are similar across different languages uh, close to each other. As you can see here with um, uh, English words and their translations in Swahili. Um, in the second step then, we would uh, learn some amount of task specific parameters on top of this model um, to adapt this model to the corresponding uh, target task of interest. Um, such as you can see here with um, the common task of natural language inference, where we try to predict the relationship between a natural language premise and a hypothesis into one of three different categories. Um, and what is quite interesting or um, quite promising with these multilingual representations is that the um, data um, on which you find in these models can come from any one of these languages um, on which the model originally has been trained on. And in practice, because data is typically most prevalent in high resource language such as English, these models are typically fine tuned uh, on one of these high resource languages. Um, and now, um, and another um, design choice here in practice is that if you're concerned that during fine tuning, the model might forget some of this multilingual information that it has acquired during pre training, um, people also in the past, mainly following um, word based representations, have also resorted to freezing these joint uh, multilingual parameters to make sure that the model does not forget any of its uh, cross lingual information it has learned in the previous step. Um, and now, given that we have still have this, uh, these multilingual parameters, as well as some task-specific knowledge that builds on these parameters, um, we can now zero-shot transfer our model to a new language um, of the same task, um, where the model has not seen any data of the corresponding task in that language, and has, is only able to transfer to that, uh, to that language based on the alignment or multilingual knowledge it has acquired in the pre-training stage. And here you can see natural language in inference uh, data in Spanish in this case. Um, now, as I mentioned previously, um, these cross lingual representations can be learned at different um, on different levels of meaning. And in the past, people have mainly uh, been learning these representations on the word level or on the sentence level or in terms of contextual representations uh, in deep neural networks. Um, and in this talk, I'm mainly going to be talking about um, state-of-the-art approaches in this line of work, which mainly, as you might imagine, um, consists of learning uh, deep contextual uh, multilingual representations. Um, however, I still think it's quite useful to be aware and knowledgeable about um, the predecessors, so these word-based counterparts, um, as a lot of the assumptions and lessons people have um, taken away from learning word-based cross-lingual representations um, still have impact and play a role for uh, contextual representations as well. Um, so if you would like to learn more about these topics, um, I've co-written a journal paper and co-given a tutorial at ACL last year, um, which are quite uh, useful points of reference on this topic. Um, now for the remainder of the talk, I'm firstly going to be talking about um, generally uh, um, ingredients um, that we know uh, at the moment uh, make these current cross-lingual um, models work in practice. Um, then I'm going to be talking about an approach that I think is particularly promising for adapting um, existing monolingual or multilingual models to your particular language of interest, um, specifically for languages where there might not be a lot of data um, available in practice. Um, and lastly, I'm going to be talking a bit more about how we can actually um, evaluate these models in practice um, and about some of the limitations and weaknesses uh, in the settings where they um, currently fail to perform well on. Um, now, starting with the first part of the talk, um, I'm uh, going to give you a bit of uh, background about the like one of the um, kind of core methods uh, or standard models that have, people have been uh, using in this line of work recently. And as you might um, imagine, with most um, most uh, ongoing state of the art work in NLP, it also relates in some way to uh, BERT. And for those of you who might not be that familiar with um, the uh, BERT transformer model, uh, I'm briefly just going to review um, the main parts that are of interest for uh, this part of the talk. Um, in particular, BERT is a large pre-trained transformer model um, where that consists of multiple stacks of transformer layers. 
um, where the um, kind of most relevant part here is that the input representations of BERT consist of um, three different components. Um, we first have a token level representation that approximately corresponds to um, previous word, um, word level representations that we've learned with approaches such as word vec uh, then we have position embeddings that roughly allow the model to learn something about um, where the uh, corresponding subword occurs in the sentence. Uh, and then we also have segment embeddings uh, to allow the model to differentiate between pairs of sentences. Um, this model is generally pre-trained using mass language modeling, where a random fraction of words in the input is uh, randomly masked. And um, the corresponding mask words are then uh, predicted in the output. Um, in the second step in which BERT is typically applied, and that um, kind of corresponds to this uh, transforming recipe um, that I showed in the beginning, um, we generally fine tune again BERT on data of um, a task of interest, such as again a natural language inference here, um, and then um, evaluate uh, the model on that task and can typically expect close to or um, relatively state of the art performance um, that way. Um, now, um, this BERT model also has been applied in the multilingual setting, in which case, unsurprisingly, it is known as uh, multilingual BERT. And multilingual BERT is very similar to its monolingual counterpart. Um, the main uh, differences um, um, mainly depend on um, the particular characteristics of this multilingual setting. Um, because now, given that this model is now not only trained of data on data in English, um, but sees during its pre-training data in many different languages, um, the initial um, subword based vocabulary that this model uses is now um, not only specific to English, but shared also across these different languages. And the main side effect um, of, this, uh, of this instance is that now um, subwords that are spelled the same across different languages are also associated with the same embedding and the same uh, ID across different languages. Um, so the, uh, the model ultimately, by using this shared subword vocabulary across different languages, um, essentially learns the same representations for similarly spelled subwords in different languages. Um, and then, as I uh, kind of explained in the beginning, this model is uh, trained uh, jointly on data in these different languages. Now, just using um, mass language modeling again, uh, where it sees both data in English as well as other languages such as Spanish here. Um, and then in practice, um, again, the model is fine-tuned on data of a high resource language um, for a given task, um, such as English here. Um, and then zero shot transferred to data of the same task in another language, such as Spanish. Um, and uh, now, if, you've, if this is the first time that you've seen or heard about this model, um, one thing that might seem perhaps quite surprising uh, to you is that this model or this general design principle applied one-to-one uh, -to, -one to the multilingual setting um, is able to learn or to, to work at all and to learn uh, at all useful representations. Um, because in practice, um, the pre-training here that you can see, the mass language modeling, um, never obtains any um, information about which words uh, correspond uh, to each other or which words uh, are translations of each other across different languages. So the only thing it sees uh, ever is only uh, individual sentences or pairs of sentences in each individual language. Um, and people initially were quite surprised that this model is actually able to effectively learn multilingual representations that perform surprisingly well on a wide range of different downstream tasks. And um, some initial studies have um, sort of analyzed uh, the reasons for this behavior. Um, and in particular, what they found or mainly hypothesized was that, the, um, that this behavior um, is mainly related to three different components. Um, the first one being um, these shared support tokens that I mentioned in the beginning, um, essentially serving as anchor points, um, which allow the model to um, figure out or to learn an initial alignment that might be useful, as often um, similarly spelled words in different languages have also similar meaning. 
And then based on these initial anchor points, the model um, through joint learning then would be able to, um, through co-occurrence information, uh, would be able to learn alignment for uh, co-occurring words and ultimately be able to learn multilingual representations um, that go beyond just um, only memorizing the vocabulary in different languages. And uh, we sought to um, uh, perform a study um, to analyze and probe these different um, criteria a bit more closely uh, um, by contrasting them with an approach that also learns multilingual representations without any of these components. Um, and what we found uh, was that uh, none of these components actually in practice necessary for uh, learning useful multilingual representations. And in practice, the model that we um, designed here uh, effectively as a counterpoint approach um, learns multilingual representations in a post hoc manner, so without um, joint training by being first trained on one language and then on another, uh, without shared vocabularies. And just to walk you um, quickly through how the model briefly works, uh, it's essentially very very similar uh, to the monolingual model applied in the multilingual setting. So we start out with a BERT model that was trained on uh, using mass language modeling again on data of a source language uh, which is English here. Um, and then in the second step we um, uh, for a new language um, we uh, again apply this model to the new language here using mask language modeling and in this case freeze all of the existing parameters of the model except for the token level representations. So the only thing that we now learn from scratch for this new language are um, these token level representations that can roughly encode um, some lexical information in the new language um, such as Spanish here. Um, then we um, go through the same, um, the same setup, the same process again um, for fine-tuning the model on a task like natural language inference here on data of the high research language um, such as English. And in this case, um, because we really want to make sure that if the model has learned any sort of cross lingual alignment, um, that we retain that actually during fine tuning. Uh, we now just uh, fine tune all the parameters of the model except for these um, English specific total level embeddings, which we freeze now. And for performing zero to transfer, the only thing that we uh, do now differently, or the only thing that we change, is that we now just replace these uh, token level embeddings from English with their Spanish uh, token level counterparts. Um, so the model itself, all of the other parameters of the model, have only ever seen English data during pre-training, and the only um, language specific information that we have supplied here is only on these on the level of token level representations. Um, so if you were or um, maybe if you thought that in order to do well in, in terms of learning multilingual representations, um, you really need to train these models jointly or to share a vocabulary, um, then this approach would not uh, work at all in practice, given that we effectively only learn um, lexical alignment, if that is possible at all. Um, and here we did a bunch of experiments in the paper, but for brevity, I'm just going to show the results on one particular task, which is this natural language inference um, task that I mentioned previously, um, which essentially studies um, this transfer from model that was um, fine-tuned on data in English in this task uh, to the corresponding languages that you can see here. And here you can um, briefly see um, some state-of-the-art models that we compared to, um, multilingual bird as well as a uh, um, larger bird that was trained in more data, um, as well as some uh, baselines um, that we train ourselves. In particular, here are uh, joint, jointly trained models that roughly replicate this original setup of multilingual bird, where we control for a number of different choices, in particular um, the number of languages that we, uh, that we train on. Um, so we train a model um, here the multilingual model on 15 different languages and we train pairwise bilingual models, so model that is only trained on the source and the target language, similar to, the, to our monolingual transfer setup, um, in a joint fashion. And here you can also see a uh, pairwise model both with and without shared vocabularies. Um, and in the disjoint case we have um, basically like a 60 uh, 4K vocabulary in total, um, because we use the same vocabulary size for both languages. And what we can see surprisingly perhaps here um, is that firstly this um, disjoint model actually outperforms its uh, 
joint vocabulary counterparts. Actually, not sharing vocabularies um, is beneficial here. And if, and if we then compare this model to our monolingually uh, transferred um, uh, model here, we can see that the um, base model um, achieves performance that is um, slightly below um, our joint baselines. Um, but if in addition, we also um, learn um, these position embeddings for the target language and um, make the model a bit more robust to replacing um, these token level representations doing zero shot transfer by adding some Gaussian noise doing sound tuning, um, we can see that we can almost completely recover this cost, uh, this gap with um, these very minimal changes. And um, so in overall, I think this demonstrates um, that this um, monolingually transparent method is um, surprisingly competitive with um, jointly trained models, which was previously kind of the main way we thought it was possible to, to learn these multilingual representations. Um, so to sum uh, things up here, we've um, seen generally competitive performance with this method across different tasks. And uh, in particular, this sort of lexical alignment um, generalized surprisingly well across different languages. And for us really um, calls into question in, to some extent, um, uh, to some extent how um, general um, the multilingual representations um, are actually that um, models like multilingual uh, bird are actually learning in practice. If we can match um, performance with them by just um, uh, training or enduring a model that um, simply has lexical level aligned uh, representations in different languages. Um, and similarly, I think on the on the more positive or bright side, I think this also demonstrates that monolingual representations perhaps are more uh, useful or more transferable in practice to different scenarios. Um, and with regards to these jointly trained methods, as we've seen, um, not having a shared subword vocabulary is actually uh, more useful in practice, uh, while training in multiple languages um, does not really help. And the most, most important factor really is um, how much capacity we have available in the model in the vocabulary for each individual language. So um, making sure that we have enough capacity for each language to learn useful token level representations. Um, now for the, uh, for the second part here and uh, the main motivation here, or as I've already kind of indicated, as we've already seen in the first half, often adding additional um, languages in these models um, is not actually that um, useful in practice in many scenarios. Um, and the main um, trade-off or the main um, uh, term that has been used to refer to this observation is um, perhaps, uh, yeah, somewhat creatively here, the, the curse of multilinguality, uh, which really depicts the trade-off between how much capacity is in your model and how many languages the model is trained on or covers with its parameters. And in practice, people have observed that um, uh, we see here when we train these massively multilingual models on many languages, a similar phenomenon that you might also expect if you train a model on many different domains or many different tasks using multitask learning, in that um, all of these languages that the model is trained on compete for uh, the capacity of the model. So for fixed model capacity, um, covering or including fewer languages in the model um, generally performs better on average. Um, However, um, if you increase the number of uh, similar languages in the beginning, there's um, a slight bump from seven to 15 languages for languages with few resource uh, data, um, mainly by including um, similar languages or similar um, related high resource languages in the pre-trained data, after which we generally observe a degradation um, uh, based on the competition um, of the parameter budget. And generally, um, scaling these models up, so adding more capacity and making your models bigger uh, helps with this to some extent. However, if we really want to train models that cover more than 100 languages or most of the world's um, written languages, uh, it's not really practical to actually train, say, trillion parameter uh, models in practice. Uh, particularly if we want to actually use them in the resource constrained environments that are actually um, most realistic in many of these low resource languages. Um, and state of the art models currently at the moment try to strike a balance by covering about 100 languages in their pre trained data. So, by making this model um, useful for 100 languages um, while still achieving reasonable performance in most of them. 
And um, for this part of the talk, um, the main motivation and the main idea was to try to find a way to bridge this gap um, for these massively multilingual models between the high resource and low resource language performance. And the main um, paradigm and the main methodology that we employed here is based on adapters um, uh, and uses adapters um, effectively as a way to allocate um, language specific capacity for the models. And adapters, if you're not familiar with them, are um, uh, components that have been previously proposed and used in models in computer vision. And these adapters essentially are small bottleneck layers. So um, mostly um, they consist of a small uh, feed forward down projection followed by an up projection um, that are inserted between a model's existing parameters. Um, so generally um, here you can see for illustration a typical standard transformer layer uh, like you might have seen it in models such as BERT or models like multilingual BERT, which I mentioned previously. Um, and now in order to add an adapter to this uh, layer, uh, we can insert it at different positions. Um, but in practice, we found, and previous work has found, it to be uh, most useful um, when inserted between the final uh, layer norm and addition in this model. So the adapter layer in this case um, essentially uh, consists of the, the feed forward down and up projection, as I mentioned, uh, combined with the residual connection. So the model, if, um, if the adapter is not um, helpful, it can simply choose to ignore the adapter using this uh, residual connection practice. And um, typically, the way these adapter uh, parameters are trained and the main um, benefit you actually uh, get from them in practice is that they are um, treated um, generally separately from the remaining parameters of the model. And, um, and adapter parameters are typically trained by taking a pre-trained uh, body of a model inserting these adapter layers into it and freezing um, the remaining parameters of the model and only training the adapter parameters on data of a particular um, task domain or language that you're interested in. And in practice, what this allows you to do is to um, learn um, adapter uh, parameters that are specific for your particular setting um, while still maintaining and keeping unchanged uh, the remaining parameter of your model. Um, so in practice, if you, um, they're most useful if you want to transfer a model or adapt a model to many different settings, so to many different tasks or domains, in which case they allow you to only add a small number of extra parameters um, for each individual setting. Whereas in the standard case, you would typically have to fine tune um, the entire body of the model from scratch for all of these different set settings. So you would have to store a separate copy of the entire model for every setting, whereas in the adapter setting, you only need to store one copy of the model um, and a small negligible amount of adapter parameters in each specific setting. Um, how this looks like in practice or in the, in the multilingual setting here is that we can uh, use these adapter um, uh, parameters to learn transformations that adapt and make the underlying model more suitable to um, a specific target setting of interest. Um, so in our case, we might fine tune, uh, we might train these adapter parameters using a task that allows us to uh, learn language specific representations like mass language modeling, um, to learn uh, language specific transformations that are specific to a particular language, such as English on the left or uh, Quechua here on the right, using um, these adapter layers. And um, the nice part is now, um, because we keep the underlying body of the model unchanged, we can simply swap in and replace the English adapter parameters that we've learned with adapter parameters that we've trained on Casual One. So we can make a model and easily apply model now um, both to English and Casual simply by swapping and plugging in and out these different adapter parameters. Um, now, the, um, the other thing that, is, uh, that we introduced here is a specific set of adaptive parameters focused on adapting the um, embedding level representations. Because um, in practice, uh, you can see here um, kind of a general um, abstract setup of um, um, general transformer model consisting of multiple stacks of transformer layers with an input embedding layer and an output embedding layer, uh, where the input and output embeddings are typically shared in practice. Um, in the adapter setup, we would add uh, separate adapter layers um, to each specific transformer layers. And as you can observe here, um, 
uh, previous approaches have not actually added any adapters or um, done any adaptation of the input level embeddings. Um, but as you might um, have taken away from the uh, first part of this talk, actually adapting or uh, finding an alignment between um, the input level representations is actually very important for multilingual transfer in practice. Um, so what we uh, propose here is um, to add adaptive parameters that take into account this sharing of input and output level in banks. So instead of um, having separate adapters for the input and output level representations, we also would like them to be shared in order, in order not to overfit to the pre-trained task. And the main way we can accomplish this based on that the adapters both have to um, modify the input uh, as well as its trump, uh, transpose uh, in the output is by making them invertible. And in this case, we simply rely on an uh, existing um, formalism of how we can uh, generally encode or um, define an invertible um, arbitrary neural network layer um, based on uh, some prior work mentioned here. Um, so in this case, we have uh, the input and um, kind of the invertible or the original um, part of this uh, invertible adapter layer, as well as its inverse on the output side. Um, now putting these different uh, things together, the um, kind of framework that we propose here, uh, we uh, refer to as MADX, uh, consists of three different components. Um, the first one being, um, um, first the training of language uh, specific adapters where again as I mentioned before we train adapters um, separately for the source and the target language where we would like to transfer to um, using mass language modeling on the Wikipedia of the corresponding languages so these models are uh, trained separately where for each language we train just the adapter parameters that then learn representations useful for that particular language um, in the second step, um, in order now to adapt, uh, to allow adaptation of the underlying model to a particular tag task of interest, we stack on top of this language adapter an adapter that we train for a particular target task. And the intuition here is that given that the adapter, hopefully uh, the language adapter, has encapsulated um, information that is useful for um, or that allows um, to adapt the model to the corresponding uh, um, source language. The um, task adapter should hopefully focus on encoding and learning representations that are useful for doing well on the corresponding target task, um, but which should hopefully be largely language agnostic, so would be useful as well for transferring to another language. Um, and then in order to transfer uh, this model to data in a different language, we can simply uh, now here plug in our language adapter for any other language um, that we've uh, trained on um, using the uh, language adapter trained in the first stage while keeping this hopefully a language agnostic uh, task adapter in practice. And um, this plug and play session really um, completely um, decouples and encapsulates um, training of uh, task specific and language specific components. Um, so in practice, we um, only have to learn these language specific adapters for um, our given language of interest once and for each task as well, um, only one time. And we can then um, directly plug them in um, to transfer model that was trained on or that has an adapter of the corresponding task to an arbitrary target language where we've learned a corresponding adapter for. Um, now we evaluate this model on a number of different tasks uh, as well, um, but I'm mainly just going to be showing here um, some results on uh, named entry recognition, uh, which I think are most interesting in practice. And uh, the, the setting, the graph here that you can see on the right, shows um, the relative um, improvement in terms of the um, performance of this task measured using F1 um, of our model compared to um, the standard um, baseline of a state-of-the-art model, XMR, which is, um, again, a large-scale uh, transformer model that was trained on multilingual data of Wikipedia and from the web that covers around 100 languages. And we've used this model as um, the foundation for our MedX model here and simply plugged in and added our adapter models to this existing multilingual model. And um, the, the languages that you can see here on both axes um, are sorted roughly from more low resource, uh, from less or from high resource to more low resource and all the way to unseen languages to the right, where unseen languages are languages that have not even been uh, seen by the model during pre-training. Um, 
So we can see here, um, and I think yeah, one of the most interesting observations is that the model, um, you can see the most uh, green. Um, so the model performs particularly well um, in the top right quadrant here, uh, which corresponds to transferring from high resource to low resource languages, which arguably is the most um, realistic setting in practice. Um, but also, if you look at kind of comes to the top left quadrant here, uh, you can generally see uh, pretty green or uh, slightly red results. So generally, we even get uh, competitive performance on high resource languages. Uh, so when transferring between high resource languages uh, using the additional adapter parameters. Um, so in summary, I hope both of the, um, from these results. Um, you were able to um, glean that adapters can be quite a useful paradigm, a useful um, framework um, to adapt an existing um, model that is already uh, already encodes knowledge for um, many different languages, um, specifically to your target language of interest, and particularly if your language does not have a lot of uh, labeled or unlabeled data associated with it. Um, and practice as part of this work and um, some other research threads um, from these collaborators also came about um, a general uh, framework for uh, training adapters in any setting in practice. Um, so you can access Adapter Hub and look up um, the adapters um, we've trained and easily download them and plug them into your own um, Hagen phase transformer models in practice. And there's even some process for uh, training your own adapters and uploading them and sharing them with the community if you're interested in that. Um, so lastly, I just want to talk a bit more about just um, some broader challenges in this area and um, specifically um, a bit more broadly um, um, evaluation of these cross single models. Um, and here specifically I want to talk about um, Extreme, um, which came about um, from the observation that um, most of the uh, these previous models, um, so multilingual methods in this area, until uh, very recently, have been evaluated, mainly looking at a limited set of tasks, so mostly focusing on um, translation or classification tasks, and looking at favorable conditions. So looking at similarly um, similar or related languages or similar domains. And um, generally, we found that uh, a large-scale benchmark that can be used to actually accurately measure and get a robust measure for um, cross-lingual transfer and cross-lingual generalization performance um, has, uh, has generally been missing. So you can um, imagine a, a similar benchmark uh, compared to uh, Gloom or Superglue in the monolingual transfer setting in English, also in the multilingual uh, transfer uh, scenario, uh, which is essentially what um, this extreme benchmark here aims to do. And extreme itself is mainly an aggregation of existing multilingual datasets um, that cover different categories of NLP tasks um, that require different levels um, to model different levels of meaning. And you can see them roughly in the bottom here, ordered in terms of their um, the complexity of natural language understanding that might be required to solve them. And um, after evaluating models on extreme on these different uh, constituent tasks, we then have a general measure um, of uh, a model's underlying cross-lingual uh, generalization ability. And to give a few more details on this benchmark, um, we try to follow a number of different uh, design criteria when selecting the tasks and languages. With regard to the tasks, we try to leverage tasks um, that are easy for humans but hard for current models to solve. Um, that rely on uh, modeling uh, diverse phenomena in natural language processing um, that are still comparatively efficient to train so that even practitioners that are working on low resource languages or with um, fewer amounts of compute can still train the models on them and evaluate on them um, that are inherently multilingual and that are generally accessible to use. And for the selection of languages, we try to strike a balance between having enough label data or enough unlabeled data available to learn high quality representations while trying to maximize the diversity of languages that we're covering. And as a result, this benchmark covers um, 40 languages from 14 different language families that together use 12 different scripts. Um, the scenario um, uh, that we've used for evaluation is similar to what I've mentioned before in that we look at the zero-shot cross-single transfer performance of these models. So we take a model that was pre-trained on uh, multilingual data in different languages. 
uh, we then fine tune it on data of a corresponding task in English, and then evaluate it via zero to transfer on data of the same task in other languages. And in practice, we found that um, this is quite, um, at least computationally efficient to get the performance um, or to obtain the impression of the performance of one model on uh, a lot of different languages because you only need to train a model once and can then directly evaluate it on all other languages. Um, we've evaluated and compared a number of um, state-of-the-art multilingual baselines, um, mainly models I mentioned before, which are essentially variants of multilingual transformers pre-trained on large amounts of unlabeled data. And we've also looked at the impact of using uh, translations, both for translating the source and the test data to the source and the uh, target language respectively. Um, but for brevity, I'm just gonna briefly highlight here um, some patterns in terms of the performance of the best performing baseline, which is XLMR, which I've all also mentioned in the previous section. And here in this chart, you can see the performance of this best performing model, XLMR, um, across the different tasks and uh, languages where each data point represents the performance on a particular task in a given language. And the legend roughly classes them based on the language family. And what you can see here is that the model achieves uh, close to human performance in English. So human performance being here the uh, red star um, and English performance being the golden cross. Um, so it, it achieves gross human performance on the easier um, since classification task on the left, um, but even performance in English is still further away on the more challenging question answering type of task. Um, we can also generally observe that there's a uh, quite a substantial gap between performance in English and performance on these other languages here. Um, while um, this gap is, or the, um, the range is quite a lot smaller for sentence classification tasks, so for the easier tasks, um, even performance in other languages comes closer to English performance, whereas we observe a much wider spread in results for the sequence labeling and retrieval tasks. And specifically, um, uh, I find that quite surprising that even for these um, sequence labeling tasks, uh, there's such a large spread, given that these tasks are quite um, easy in the few shot or monolingual setting. So um, both part of speech checking and named entity recognition models achieve performance in the 90s um, kind of in general. Um, but uh, in terms of transferring um, between different languages, uh, models seem to struggle in particular between transferring structural or syntactic information, at least the current generation of models. Um, breaking down performance by language family, we can see that as perhaps expectedly, models perform um, well or best on Indo-European language, language families, which typically have a lot of pre-trained data and unlabeled data on the web associated with them, and comparatively poorly on languages with fewer resources, such as African languages or languages with different scripts. And overall, um, these state of the art methods still have many limitations for distant languages. So, in our scenario, languages that are linguistically dissimilar from English and languages with limited amounts of pre trained data. Um, now, since we've published this paper, we've also open sourced the benchmark, which has seen some external submissions. And what I think is quite interesting here that compared to our best performing um, baseline, XMR, um, there's been a substantial jump already in recent months in terms of average performance on this benchmark task. And in particular, the largest jump has been achieved uh, specifically for sentence retrieval tasks, which have been, uh, which have mainly profited from um, using additional um, sentence level data and parallel data. So using translations for either pre-training or fine-tuning these representations, which is quite, uh, yeah, which is generally useful or generally most similar to this cross-lingual sentence retrieval task, where we, given a source language, have to identify its corresponding um, translation from a pool of target language sentences. Um, now, if this speak to interest and you're uh, interested in using or evaluating on this benchmark, we've made available some scripts in um, uh, that build on Hagen Face Transformers um, and also scripts that you can uh, use to download and fine tune models easily on this data. And in addition, we've also released some automatic translations that are high quality um, for all of the 40 languages for the different tasks um, in this benchmark. Uh, now, in conclusion, uh, just to summarize the main takeaways here, um, 
as I mentioned in the first part, um, a shared vocabulary is not actually, in fact, um, necessary uh, for learning these multilingual representations. And uh, we can obtain unexpectedly good performance by transferring with monolingual representations. Um, secondly, adapters, I think, are quite a, um, quite a versatile paradigm for allocating language-specific capacity. And I think are going to uh, be particularly useful for transferring to low resource settings. Um, certainly, um, these days, uh, cross-lingual transfer learning still has many challenges, particularly when it comes to generalizing to low resource languages or to more structural types of tasks. Um, and lastly, I hope you've obtained the impression that Extreme might be able to provide a window into models, um, perhaps true cross-lingual generalization performance, and the code and the leaderboard are available under those links. Um, so with that, here are um, some references if you want to learn uh, and read up on some of the papers that I mentioned. And with that, I want to thank you all for uh, your attention and uh, thank all of my collaborators for, um, for collaborating with me on these exciting projects.